weak than others have as you say, they cannot stand this uh, kind of either or, 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 or kind of let's mix it. So I'm trying to get a more original sort of it by opening yourself up to the bodily sphere, which to the experience as such. And certainly Jung is coming back as a great philosopher who was always under us. So far, I'm, uh, no, yeah. I think you're, you're, you're very correct. Well, I mean, sometimes, you know, you have an hour, an hour and a half to make a point, and the best way of doing it is by stressing the contrast <coughs> instead of drawing the gray areas. But you're right that life is about the gray areas. You know, great contrast, those great dichotomies may be useful pedagogically and may be useful rhetorically to make a point and to change some minds, but if one is a serious philosopher, one has to be willing to to look at the gray areas uh, and, and, and not to be so, not, not to territorialize philosophy so sharply. With the Humean territory, the Kantian territory, mark them with P or something, and then not letting anyone in on its side. P is what? Yellow snow. I told you not to eat the yellow snow. <laughs> but you're right. You can always find a Marlou Ponty who was kind of suspicious of language, and at, or at least the hege hegemonic role that language acquired in the 20th century, and who was much more open to intensities. You have a Bergson, who is, is considered kind of a phenomenologist, but who also was you know, not fully linguistic. And you can find parts in Heidegger, and you can, you can even find parts in, in, in Husserl, uh, where they, in fact, it, 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 got an important insight, an important insight as far as sensation and, 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 and intensity goes. It shouldn't go to waste just because we are dogmatic humans. In fact, we need every single resource we can use in the 21st century to, to, to propel philosophy forward. And so you're absolutely right, let's keep our mind open and let's play in the gray areas instead of trying to, 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 to do everything black and white. Uh, uh, except, of course, when, when I am the one who's giving the talk, I can get away with things like that. <laughs> Questions, guys? I was thinking, maybe it's not only that I want to but it um, seems like that absence is a form of presence, right? So that by denying the, the tree nymphs or that imagination to be as real as reality, you're merely changing the mode of being. And it's, but what I find interesting about your philosophy is then you fall back upon your system of materials that then you fall back upon like peyote or these things that like have physicality in order to then allow yourself access to these other ways of being. <coughs> if you were able to uh, not be so dogmatic about the materialist position, you would just see that the tree nymphs are there even when you don't take the peyote. The, the tree nymphs? Is that a little feature? his person down to the river and he says, look, this is what the tree nymphs are. For, for Socrates and for Plato, the tree nymphs existed, is what I'm saying. They existed just as much as... But what are... The tree nymphs is a name for a, for a, for a fictional character? Like, I don't know. Was it fictional for Socrates? Or did I, you, I never heard the word tree nymphs. I'm just, you just completely... Woo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> tree, so you're right. Don't feel you like the yogi. Tree spirit. Oh, I see what you mean. Well, yes and no, man, because look, <laughs> when you're a realist, when you're a materialist, you have to start making decisions, you know, but do heaven and hell exist? Are we going to accept that they exist because there's millions and millions of people that say they exist? Is there a good thing to believe in that God that plays morality plays and, and that you have to fear and whose wrath one day will come? to send you to hell? Right. Or should we eliminate those totally fictional places from our ontology first thing off? Right, but I'm not trying to bring back a Christian. I'm saying what about that I mentioned a Christian example right. because I could mention anything else. Right. It doesn't matter. When, when you go to a primitive tribe and you see that their plant medicine works, when you go to other cultures and see that acupuncture works or that yoga works, there is a fact of the matter as to why they work. I believe in yoga. I believe in acupuncture, I certainly believe in herbal medicine, because I believe we can have an explanation, materialist explanation, whether it has to go beyond current science or not. You know, for instance, acupuncture. How is it possible that 
you are putting something in one place which is supposed to cure you for something that's completely far away, that's not even linked by any muscle or any closer. But perhaps there is a topological map of electrical activity around the cells that we have not discovered yet because we are not, we, our science is not subtle enough. In that topological map of topology in general, there are no distances. And things are interconnected in ways that, are, that go beyond their actual physical connection. But that is not an explanation of materialism. That is not just let's, you know, let's every world be, be equally bounded, which is of course the, the position that you follow with if you follow for years. We for years thought that the way to be politically useful to tribal societies was to say, hey, your worldview is exactly as valid as that of the physicist or the biologist and so on. With your funky words, if you say that this lead cures because the spirit of Mount Bai is in the lead and it cures, that is every bit as valid as saying that it cures because it has a particular carbon uh, a compound that adheres. Now, are you really defending people by saying that? Think about it this way. Think about it this way. What happens when they want to patent those leaves? An international corporation could come in and steal those leaves because they could go to the patent office and say, look, those leaves think that there's some kind of ancestor spirit that's curing you. They don't know the mechanism. So therefore, they don't own their knowledge. You're trying to help them by telling them, yes, your worldview is equally as valid as ours. And what you're doing is opening the way for all those parasites and all those predators that go in there and try to steal that knowledge. Whereas if you say the reason why these leaves work, because the reason why they're antibiotic, for instance, and placed upon a wound, they don't, they don't allow infection, is because they have a natural antibiotic that took them many generations of these people to discover and to classify and they own that knowledge. They should be able to patent it, and if anything, we money out of it, or at least not be stopped. And again, I love Cliff, and I spent a whole year with him, and I love his thick descriptions of things. He, he's someone of us who believes in language and believes so much that creates descriptions of, 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 of technological uh, situations that are invaluable. But by, by pretending that reducing everything to the linguistic value of experience with a, with a kind of epistemological relativism that goes with it, you're protecting those tribal areas, you're protecting people, he made a mistake with that. Because you are, in fact, infantilizing them. You are, you are pretending that their explanations are right, doesn't matter what, even if they won't be valid in other contexts, and even you won't, they won't be able to defend their rights to that knowledge. So I would say, Respect their beliefs. For instance, if you see a little three-year-old waiting for Santa Claus the following day, you know, it's, 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 it's December 24th, and you see that magic in its eye, you know, waiting for Santa and putting the little milk for Santa and so on, you would have to be a sadist and a psycho to go, you know, yes, cookies and stuff. Finish cookies. Santa doesn't exist, fool. <laughs> There are contexts in which you want to respect people's beliefs. It doesn't matter how absurd they are. As I, as I mentioned last year, I, of course, don't believe in Jesus Christ. I don't believe in heaven. I don't believe in angels. But when somebody prays in a very devout and intense way to a God that doesn't exist, I don't care. Because the intensity of the devotion and the seriousness of the moment is respectable. You're not going to tell him, okay, you know, you're, 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 you're praying to a non-existent entity that doesn't exist in the material world. You say, whatever it is you're praying to, I respect the intensity of your devotion. But when somebody just goes through the steps of praying every night in a routine kind of way, thinking that, okay, well, I may have, you know, I cheated on my wife today, but now I'm going to pray and I'm going to, you know, cleanse myself again. I'm going, you're making a fool of yourself, you <laughs> idiot. You know, it doesn't even work that way. So there are contexts and there are contexts. If you go to, you know, I hate churches, I hate mass, I hate the whole thing, but there are certain churches in which religion and the intensity of devotion and the intensity of togetherness, and they sing together the praises of life, and you can see in their faces that it's genuine and it's sincere. I admire those guys, despite the fact that they are singing to a non-existent entity. And I would even... I would find it distasteful to go in that church and tell them, look, you're praying to the wrong person.